You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Friday. August 12th, 2016. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the four-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, it's our 1400th program of this iteration of the majority report folks and to celebrate we're just going to make that announcement i just made but it's casual friday that means cliff Schechter will be here also to give us a film recommendation matthew film guy On the program today is Obama and Clinton's brewing TPP war real. Turns out Donald Trump is sarcastic in his speech and his writing. Bigly. Bigly. Nevertheless, RNC hitting the panic button. Congress apparently knew, or at least several leaders of Congress apparently knew of the DNC hack over a year ago and how Hillary Clinton's campaign is enabling the GOP but also promoting progressive policy meanwhile Donald Trump apparently has no campaign anywhere are we watching an exit strategy Harry Reid floating a plan to get Merrick Garland on the court. Can't quite figure that one out. All that and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I do want to say a word about this being our 1400th show. Um, I mean, it's not actually, I think, our 1400th show. It's probably like our 1400th and... 20th or something, but we, uh, at one point, we decided to um, switch from indicating the date of the show to putting a number on it, and for whatever reason, I can't remember why we did this. I mean, I know I told you, Matt, not to do it, but what, what, what was the reason? Like I said, don't do the first couple of of weeks because we didn't have good descriptions. I don't know. What was it? Yeah, there was something like that. I can't remember why. So we've done more than that on this show, but whatever. We, we choose 1,400 because, uh, let's be honest, that's also, what difference does that make? Um, you know, the majority report uh, was uh, on a radio in a different uh, format than this and uh, the Sam Cedar show and Cedar on Sundays and, so, uh, God, I don't know. This could be this could be like show. This could be episode three thousand for me, somewhere in that neighborhood. Nevertheless, this iteration of the show could not exist without our members' support. So, uh, I want to I want to thank you for allowing us uh, to do this on a daily basis, and I want to thank all of you for listening uh, on a, a daily basis or a semi daily basis. I know some of you you'll listen like three times a week. Some too. Even a few of you, once a week. Not sure why. It's a little bit weird. I don't want to make you feel awkward, but it's a little bit weird that you would just listen one time a week, not two. We can talk. Once you're at two, we can talk about three. But for now, once a week, weird. Strange. Nevertheless, I want to thank our members. And if you want to join the ranks of the people who actually make this possible. There's no executives. There's no jerk who's telling us to do this or that. There's no big funders who say, like, could you please... Why, why do you have that look on your face? Kelly, you look upset about that. Oh, I didn't look... I looked skeptical. 
Because sometimes maybe, maybe you're the jerk telling us to do this or that. <laughs> All right. Well, that's true. <laughs> There's no jerk telling me what to do. And um, and there's no there's no there's no big funders who say, uh, you know, we really don't want you to touch that area, or we want you to promote that area, or, um, and what we also don't do is pander. I'm not going to name names, although there is one who sticks out in my uh, Twitter feed that is really really annoying me, where it's just, like the 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 news. And the analysis is dictated by uh, what kind of YouTube clicks that entity or person gets. I'm not going to say who it is. I'm not going to. But it drives me crazy. You're being sarcastic anyway. I'm being sarcastic. I'm being sarcastic. (laughs) I have mentioned Texture on this program before. It is an app that lets you tap into the world's most popular magazines anytime, anywhere, using your smartphone or your tablet or whatever your little device is. I guess that's it. There's basically the smartphones and the tablets. You can, go, you can breeze through uh, hundreds of your favorite magazines. You can go back into the archives. You can pick the articles that interest you the most and create your own magazine out of it, essentially. It's like, I mean, it's like, for me, it's sort of like I use it, you know, I use Twitter this way in some ways in a way of I get pushed uh, articles that I want. Um, I use something like maybe Instapaper as a way of, of getting a specific articles. Uh, but there's a bunch of magazines that you got to pay to have access to. And this brings it all together. One monthly fee. It's like, it's like Netflix in some respects. And you can, you know, binge read, uh, it, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it really is great. Um, and I like a wide variety of magazines. I'll go through what I have on my favorites. Uh, but there's, there's, a, there's a ton more. I mean, there's literally hundreds of magazines. But the thing is, is that there's some magazines I still get in print. I get like, or I used to anyways, uh, up until very recently. And I'm going to end up letting all of these subscriptions lapse because I can buy it in one bulk, and it's going to be cheaper for me. But the Atlantic and Harper's, Harper's actually is not, they don't access, I don't believe on this, but the Atlantic, um, the New Yorker, Mother Jones, Handyman, Family Handyman. I know, people are surprised by that. But yes, I have that. Uh, And I've been reading that religiously. Uh, People, long-time listeners know I get very excited when that's been, uh, that comes into uh, the... Uh, office. But now I can also read The Hollywood Reporter or Successful Farming, which I have as one of my um, favorites. This Old House, because again, I do a little bit of woodwork. In fact, I read wood and wired. Let me scroll back up. Rolling Stone magazine, real simple. I like to look at like architecture ideas, popular mechanics, parents, because I need a little bit of guidance. National Geographic. Modern Farmer. Fast Company. Right? Your buddies over there? Esquire. Dwell. Yeah. These are all magazines that I have access to on my, uh, my phone right here. I mean, there's more I could, but these are my favorites I'm going through. So CNET, you have Dwell? Uh, Bird and Blooms. Dwell's great. Uh, Chiquita. I actually haven't read anything from that one yet. but um, And then what I do is I find stories, I save the stories, I read them all together. It's fantastic. And the best part for you is that Texture is offering you, my listeners, a free trial right now when you go to texture.com slash majority. You'll gain immediate entry to all the top magazines, including back issues and bonus video content. Start binge reading for free right now when you go to texture, T-E-X-T-U-R-E dot com slash majority. Texture dot com slash majority. Check it out, folks. You're going to love it. All right. We're going to take a break. We're going to uh, come back uh, with Cliff Schechter. But again, oh, I, I guess the point is, if you want to be a member, uh, go to join the majority report dot com.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. That, of course, was the replacements. Alex Chilton really sort of uh, re-energized Alex Chilton's uh, career. And uh, people started buying Big Star albums. And uh, But for me, it, it's a little bit sad because it was sort of the, uh, the replacements were starting to, you get the feeling that they were basically starting to roll things up a little bit. Uh, nevertheless, that's not why we're here. I'll tell you why we're here. Not to listen to the replacements, but to listen to this theme song. Cliff Shackdown, Libertas LLC. New media, public relations, and strategy. You want any of these services, you know who you gotta see. Cliff Shackdown. LLC. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Cliff Schechter. How are you, Cliff? Samuel, I'm doing well. How about you? I am doing great. Um, not getting a lot of sleep. The kids are going through something. I don't know what the heck it is, but... Um, Both of them are going through something. Oh, it's, you know how it is. Is it like back to school coming kind of thing? It's actually getting to the point where Mila is a little bit easier to deal with than Saul. And that is, uh, that I can't, you know, three is not uh, my favorite age. Three is not my favorite age. No, they, they call it the terrible twos. But for us, it seemed like it was more the terrible two years that lasted from about one and a half to three and a half. Mm. But, uh, you know, it, it, I suppose it differs. Yeah. By, uh, well, by genetic uh, makeup, and obviously there's all sorts of crap floating around in my family genes. So. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not necessarily <laughs> genetic either. It could be just sort of like awareness of like, oh, God, I can't believe these. this is my parents. No, no, no. In my case, it's shitty genetics. <laughs> I think my case, it could be just, uh, it could be actually the uh, nurture. Uh, the, the kid oh. could just re- realize like, oh, I'm going to be stuck with you for another 15 years. Well, and, yeah, I didn't know this was part of the deal, this guy. Right. I mean, to be fair, I've also said that to him, so uh, I guess we're even. All right, Cliff, <laughs> when we got on, uh, there's a couple of things I want to talk about. I mean, uh, not the least of which, um, there's, there's a little TPP war going on. I don't know if you, you've caught that, but let's start with have, the yeah, polls yeah. here. Um, there are new Marist polls that have come out in swing states. Is that right? That is correct. All right. Yes, well, uh, let's update that. There was a point in time they were known as swing states. <laughs> if these Marist polls are correct, they would no longer seem to be such. Um, and it's interesting, you know, because, again, I'm always skeptical. I need proof in the form of multiple polls before I believe anything good, bad, or in between. But there have been, you know, there's a lot of evidence. A number of polls have come out that have shown Hillary Clinton pulling away in both Colorado and Virginia, such that the campaign itself, which has adopted a lot of Obama's data operation, which is a pretty impressive operation, has stopped advertising in those two states because they think they've put them away. And they, now they may start again. But so let's start with that. Um, the the newest polls that come from Maris, which is generally a, a good pollster, uh, show a 14 point lead in Colorado. Uh, 56-42, a 13-point lead in uh, Virginia, a 9-point lead, 48-39 to 39 in North Carolina, another shocker, and then 44-39 to 39 in Florida, which is also a pretty amazing margin when you consider that, that Obama beat Romney by less than one point there. Um, and then you start factoring in the, the, the ground game or lack thereof that, that Trump has to make any of this up. He just said in a comment yesterday, you know, that, uh, oh, yeah, you know, it seems to me that people want to vote for Trump. I always like how he refers to himself in the third person. They'll go out and vote for Trump. So he clearly gets how campaigns work and how turnout works. And the thing is, is that there have been a ton of articles. There's the, there's the fact that there's only one field office open in Florida. Romney had like 10 open by now. There's an article actually on My Little Neck of the Woods. Yeah, in Cincinnati, I saw that piece, uh, that there was an email that somebody got hold of that showed how the campaign is completely panicking. And, and, and like, literally, uh, the, the best way, let me just uh, broadly uh, describe it, and then you can, you can talk about the specifics. But it's yep. literally like watching someone walk to the bathroom in a pitch-dark apartment 
that has a lot of windy uh, hallways. Like they're just like they're just going like, hey, does anybody know if the local Republicans support us? <laughs> That's a, an amazing question to be asking, you know, 85 days out from an election. That's just That's amazing. Right. I mean, that's what's amazing is that so many Republicans are opposed in a way that if it were Mitt Romney or John McCain or almost anybody else, you would just assume they're with you. But, but you know, look, there are even some Republicans who endorse Obama over Romney, as I remember. Uh, and and you see, so you want to go in and see who's with you. This is the kind of thing you think that maybe in April or May you would have fully ascertained. Right. But there, uh, just a more, a, a more of an example of that this guy's a joke. And again, he, you know, you, you learn a lot. Paul Waldman wrote a great piece the other day about how when, when presidential campaigns, you learned a lot about how these, these guys will be president. They're, they're pl- pluses and minuses, in some cases many minuses, with a George W. Bush or a Bill Clinton or others. You had a very good idea for how their presidency was going to run, Obama. And, you know, it, it, but you also, I think, it's an insight into their business, and it's amazing to me, even with all the, the uh, you know, being born on third base and everything that Trump started off with, that he's lasted – I mean, it's not a surprise. He's gone bankrupt numerous times. He's going to be hires entirely incompetent people just because they kiss his butt and all that kind of stuff. But it still is amazing to me that, that it just tells you a lot of the things we've talked about before about, about laws not applying to rich people that this guy isn't in prison because the people he surrounds himself with are generally of, of a incompetent or criminal ilk. Um, and and uh, so, I mean, in any case, that's what's going on. I mean, there's a, there's a, to get, bring it back to Cincinnati, Jeremy Fugelberg, uh, who's a great reporter here for the Cincinnati Inquirer, reported this. You know, they, they've got a, a uh, basically a shack that a bunch of volunteers got together and decided would be the Trump headquarters <clears throat> here. There's Folks, oh, let, me just, let me just re- reiterate something. We are talking about what is considered the crucial swing state and perhaps the crucial county in that crucial yeah. swing state. I mean, it could arguably be the most important county in the country that when it correct. comes to the... I uh, live in probably, yeah, I live in, if not the most important county, because to explain Ohio to people, Cuyahoga up where Cleveland is has always been the Democratic stronghold. And uh, Columbus, was, you know, which is you know, in the middle of the state, Franklin County is a more of a, a kind of a swing area, but it's been moving to the left. But Hamilton County here was always the home of kind of, you've got Procter & Gamble, these sort of, the kind of more moderate business Republicans were here. You know what I mean? Back when, before the parties realigned, and now they've realigned even further. Um, and so you had a lot of these kind of corporate Republicans here. Now, granted, a lot of the, but a lot of them have been moving away over the years. But it's kind of like what we're seeing in these polls in Virginia and Colorado too, is that where you have better educated Republicans, the split is now not is is further than just along the lines that it was before, which it was along the lines often of city versus you know city and inner suburbs versus outer suburbs and rural that kind of thing. Now you're looking at. Uh, th- that the split, especially I'm talking about among white voters, is how educated you are. Because the, the Republicans have won college-educated voters going back to Eisenhower's time, and gra- they've been losing them gradually. But Trump has literally kicked that you know, over into the ravine. So right. they're now well down. And what that means is, is in a place like Hamilton County, so Obama won in 2008 here for the first time a Democrat had won here since uh, LBJ in 64 in the landslide. Um, Sherrod Brown won here in 12, uh, and the only county, he, he, his, his win margin from 2006 was six points instead of 12, so he lost a number of counties he had won, but the only county he picked up in 12 that he lost in six was Hamilton. This area has been moving that way as more sort of esque Republicans have been switching and being horrified by the Democratic Party. This has sped that up a lot. By so the Republican you have Party. to have, I mean, I'm sorry? By the Republican Party. I'm sorry, from the Republicans to the Democratic Party. So, so they need to, you know, the Republicans here, they need to sort of figure out who the hell their people are. And they've got this basically one... It looks they need to like figure out what's going on, what the hell's going on, in other words. Right, with a couple people volunteering, working and making some phone calls. Um, they don't have any data. They don't know who they're calling. They don't know, you know, they don't have any kind of regular knock-on-doors kind of planning. Like the GOTV is a joke. They've got nothing, and we're 85 days out. <clears throat> to give you an idea, Mitt Romney had a, either three or four um, offices, headquarters up months earlier than this. Right, in, in June. County. And, in Ju- and he still lost here. Obama still won here in 12. Uh, and it's trending in that direction, and so Trump's ignored it. And I, I mean, so yeah, I mean, 
this is up there with like the Orlando area and a few others where if you lose your, as a Republican, you're kind of screwed. And and I also um, imagine, I mean, we've talked about this, that it's not like John Kasich is going to activate whatever machine he has there to go and rescue Donald Trump. Right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, it, when you go into the first day of the convention in, in Ohio and you insult the governor and say he's embarrassing himself and stuff like that and, and get him to the point where he refuses to support you. So that's where these insulting governors of, of states like Ohio really hasn't worked out very well for him. I mean, I have to be, um, to be fair, I have uh, done similar things, not necessarily with governors, but with other people in uh, the industries I'm in. And uh, I can tell you right like now that it's... The uh, entirety of Air America. Uh, and, and, and beyond. Um, that it doesn't... Um, it, 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 eventually that stuff tends to catch up with you. <laughs> <laughs> At least in my experience. I can speak to that too. Um, I'm fired from a couple political campaigns because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. It's not a, it's not a positive way to go. When you're running no. for president, uh, it's smart to maybe if you want to nurse all those grudges, save them for when you actually are president. Exactly. Saying it at that exact. So I mean, uh, it's uh, you know, and, and again, I think that's what we're seeing in polling. I think it's really interesting. It's why Virginia, Colorado, and North Carolina, in some ways have jumped ahead in terms of their democratic lean states like Iowa and Ohio and others because you've got a higher proportion of college educated whites. You know, here's and the thing. We've never seen this. I mean, maybe maybe uh, you know, uh going back before you and I were a little more sentient, but usually what happens is you get the bumps after the convention Things start to die down. By now, you start to see the, 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 you know, the bumps sort of melt away a little bit and things start to calm down. And the trajectory is such that things slow down a little bit and things don't start ticking up again until late September. The idea that you would see a bump that is actually less than where it will be in a week and a half from that bump of the convention We've just not seen that before, right? And and of course, we've also never seen what Trump has been doing, and et cetera, et cetera. So, right. right. Well, that's why you wait because you always say, "Well, this might just be the convention bump." We're now more than two weeks out from the convention, and it, even you know, because there were some polls. I never believed the fifteen point poll or thirteen. That seemed crazy. I believe that it, you know that anything between about nine and twelve points, and then it it has in, in national polls. You know, after Trump had at least a couple days in between one crazy episode and another, it seemed like, you know, it started to recede slightly so that a lot of that was permanent damage, but maybe a little bit of it was just still the convention bounce. So it's, it went down to some polls saying 7.6 points, points. You know, I saw a number of those. But then, of course, he started this week off, you know, uh, and this week has basically spent the entire week either saying that his, the opposite candidate should be assassinated or – saying that, uh, that, that the opposite candidate and the current president founded ISIS, and he's moved the last couple of days into something that I'm sure makes Republican voters and donors really happy, which is, yeah, I don't care if I win or lose. I get to go on a nice vacation afterwards either way. Right. I mean, that um, is, uh, he had an interview basically where he said, like, look, I can go back to my great life. And, 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 and frankly, uh, so let's talk about the, this to a certain extent, because, I mean, ultimately, uh, this is all well and good, but I want to uh, make sure that we have time to get to, you know, sort of the stuff that um, is going to at least in some way potentially implicate policy or if not create some type of alignment. I mean, realignment, because because yep. now I think we're at the stage right where there's I, I mean, I have a theory that I think Trump has basically said, OK, I'm moving on. I'm back to plan A, which is. I'm using this campaign as a way of increasing my profile, and I'm getting ready. This is all about exit strategy for me now. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know. What's funny, though, is there anybody in the world who doesn't know who he is at this point? Right? I mean, it's sort of like, well, you're right. It's not just about, I mean, that's a logical thing for him because he, you know, picks out any moral considerations, what he owes people or anything else, people who put their savings into him, although maybe we should question their sanity. But, you know, he's he, he, logically you say, well, I want to increase my brand. I want to do this and that. I'm doing this for me. But the, the interesting thing at this point is um, he, he turned himself into somebody that a lot of elite people, you know, I mean, who used to be comfortable around him will no longer be. Yeah, but you I know, don't he's made I, himself a pariah of sorts. I, listen, I don't I don't I don't think that I, I think actually that's I, I, I think his internal logic actually makes some sense here. 
if you look at the agenda, I mean, I happen to be one of those people who subscribe to the idea that he is going to launch some type of media style empire. And, you know, it, you don't need 40 percent of the American public to know who you no, are. You need what you need. If you have 20 yeah. percent of the American electorate that thinks that you are the single truth teller. And you have created, over the course of a campaign, over the next several months, a narrative that their hopes and dreams have been undercut by the likes of Fox, by the likes of the Republican establishment, by uh, right. crooked Hillary and, you know, the secret Muslim. I mean, even if you have 10 percent of those people... I mean, even and if he Roger gets down Arnold to ten, to have nothing to do with the. At this well, point, I so. think he probably has a non-compete clause. But if you, if you to take, if he could even shed, I mean, we see him at these polls, right? He's in the mid to high thirties in these polls. Even if he was to shed two thirds of those people and just get down to like where he's polling at ten percent, if they are like, if they Look, are, the O'Reilly show is huge when it hits three million people. Yeah, I, I mean, that would be. Um, a huge for him. And so I'm not convinced that's not where we're at this stage. But put that aside for a moment. No, I, I, I agree with you. I, and so in that way, the thing about Trump is, and again, you know, his damaged psyche, it's always to him, he's never been accepted by the insider crowd as much as he wants to be, right? He's always been this guy, Queens, peering over into Manhattan. You know, that's sort of his mentality. And the thing is now, the irony of all this is, you're right, he's got a lot more sort of mass... Uh, fans, like a mass appeal among regular people, but the very elite who he wants to accept him, he's now pushed further away. So you're, you're not going to see him become any less unhinged after he loses this thing. Oh, no, he's and I think it's going to be... angry and crazy. I mean, you know, you see pictures of him where he used to be able to play, go play golf. Hell, hell right? Wedding, showing up at the Clintons, showing up at his wedding, or going to play golf with Bloomberg. Or, I mean, besides like Giuliani and Christie, if Christie's not in prison by then, and like a few other people in the New York area, I mean, think about how unpopular he is among the entire elite uh, that he, he, you know, in his mind, wants so badly to be a part of in the New York area. Yeah, I guess. But I, I, I think, um, you know, uh, money will win out. And if his uh, media empire gets big enough, um, you know, I'm sure in his mind it's like they'll come back to him. And, and they very well may. But wait a sec, I want to go further than this. Okay, so put that aside. Okay. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe he's still earnestly trying to do it. I mean, we got uh, clips uh, that we'll play later about where he's explaining to Hugh Hewitt, essentially saying like, oh, the reason why I'm saying that the Obama founded it is because he gets me more media attention. Uh, but he doesn't seem to understand that, like, we're, he's not running for the Republican primary anymore. He's running it with normal people, and normal people don't appreciate that, even if they hear about it. But so put that aside. What's really relevant now, it seems to me, is whether or not he's actually engaging in this sort of exit strategy. If I am there was a there was a thing that came out like uh, 70 Republican uh, or 50 Republican operatives or former Republicans Wrote yeah, 70, to, they called on the party to stop funding it. Yeah, and they're having this emergency meeting at the um, Waldorf Astoria in Miami or somewhere like that today. Uh, I don't think Trump's going to be there, but uh, Trump uh, campaign representatives are. They're meeting with the RNC. I think they're just going to all get together and just go like, uh, we, uh, he won't listen to us. Uh, yeah, you won't listen There's to us. There's going to be that. a lot of that. I think yeah. it's just going to be, let's party. Let's party. <laughs> we got, we're all here. <laughs> We're all getting well, we're all expensing this. Throw some good but bashes. I think we've got the coke. I think, like, look. I mean, at one point, right? If this guy is sinking at this rate, the Republican Party has to jettison him, and it's just only going to. It becomes. I mean, I think the prophecy is already going to be fulfilled, but it becomes even more of a self fulfilling prophecy where people are just like, "I'm not going to go down with this ship." And yeah, uh, but the interesting thing is he is, that that. You know, I thought I, Josh Marshall had a really good take on this. That, you know, and I know that you, I saw you retweet something you know, that Corey Robin had sent out. Yes. You know, and it was whether you should tie, you know, that the sort of annoyance at, at Hillary Clinton's strategy of not tying other Republicans to him. Yeah. And I think there's some, there's some, there's some a good point to be made there. But Josh was making a point that I think is true, which is you really can actually get away with both. You can get away on the national level with saying. You know, we, we know saying this guy is he's 
individually uniquely crazy, uniquely you know incompetent, should not be able to serve, and winning over some of these Republican endorsees. But on the state level, uh, they can still attack him, as you see a great Ann Kirkpatrick ad doing with John McCain and others, and tying these guys to them. And it's working right now. Like, you know, numerous polls now show that Maggie Hassan is at least four or five points up in New Hampshire because the, the bottom has fallen out from under Trump in New Hampshire. It's now because New Hampshire, it's a classic uh, one of these things where New Hampshire, a very white state, but has a really high education level. And so it's filled more than a state like, like let's say, Iowa, where, it, where Hillary may be one of the few states where Hillary could actually potentially do worse than Obama because that's one of the few places where Trump's win over white working class voters strategy maybe helps a little bit. But in a place like New Hampshire, he's, it seems like he's just offended everybody. I didn't believe it at first when I saw it was 13 points or something. We've now had four polls showing it at 10 points or more. So at, that, at some point, I have to start believing that he is – uh, so I mean, uh, how is how is Kelly Ayotte gonna gonna make that up if 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 he loses by 12 points there, um, and a whole bunch of people just don't even show up because they're so right. so out of it? There's there's no way. I mean, uh, you know, Ron Johnson. I think Feingold was always gonna beat Johnson, but Mark Kirk is a classic example. He's gonna be done in Illinois, um, and you're gonna see you see it happening with Toomey in Pennsylvania, which uh, and McGinty, frankly, is not a very good candidate, who I'm very much not right. impressed by. Um, I, I think anybody you could fit in there, and the fact that Pennsylvania has a five-point further Democratic lean or so, maybe at least three-point further Democratic lean than Ohio, means that McGinty and Strickland, who both, frankly, have not been very impressive candidates, I'm not sure Strickland's going to pull it off here, whereas, uh, you know, whereas I think McGinty can pull it off on the strength of what's going to happen at the top of the ticket. Wow. The Strickland's been that bad, huh? It, it, you know, he just made a remark the other day, like, it was great timing when Justin, when Antonin Scalia died because it helped the labor. Yeah, he I mean, I've said that a hundred times, I think, probably. Yeah, but you're not running. I've said it, too. We're not running for office and trying to win over swing voters. We're talking to, our, our, to people who think like us. I'm talking um, to the swing voters, too. I just don't need them to vote for me. Um, that's right. Yes, exactly. I, yeah, I, any swing voter that wants to listen to us, I'm happy. But I, uh, to have them do that and send us all their money. Couldn't he sort of them. rejigger that and say, "Great timing," insofar as that Ant and Scalia, even in death, did something wonderful for the country. That's what he should have said. <laughs> um, he just—it's one of the reasons I was such a PG Sittenfeld supporter. I get why the DSCC got behind him. They figure universal name recognition here. He's a likable enough guy. But he's, you know, he, he's older, and I don't mean that as an insult, but he just doesn't, he doesn't have the strength. And his, I mean, his, his campaigns, he's very sort of on his feet, says things, and, and sort of contradicts himself. I'm not saying it's a done deal. I'm just saying I'm just he's saying a bad candidate. And, and, he's, and, he's, he's not a good candidate the way McGinty is not a good candidate. But the difference between the lean at the top of Pennsylvania and Ohio may be the difference. I mean, frankly, McGinty that's... May, that's that's sort of what we're seeing with with the presidential race, right? I mean, Hillary Clinton, uh, is, say what you will about whether or not she will be a good president uh, or, or you, you know disagree or agree with her policy set, but I think you're you're hard pressed to find people who say like she's a great candidate. I mean, she's just right. a, yeah. She's oh, a, that's exactly right. I mean, she's made made right. some awful mistakes, obviously. Uh, some of but, them even. Obviously, some of the bigger ones, even before she ran, which she should have yep. made knowing she was yep. going to run. Um, yep. So, yeah, no, no, no. Well, you're, actually, you're exactly right. right about that. So let's talk about this. So there's, there's, there's actually, um, there's, there's like two or three paradoxes here. One paradox that you're talking about, and, and, and um, I, I have a feeling in the coming days I'm going to want to talk about this more and won't necessarily get to it, but I, I mentioned it the other day. There was a... There was a uh, a DNC email, which was complaining about Clinton's strategy of trying to make, and I've said this for, in fact, the thing that I wanted that that I wanted Trump to do was to hurt the Republican Party, and I do feel like there is a missed opportunity where we make Trump so uh, so particularly bad, like he's even he's not Republican. He's something else like that whole uh, mm -hmm. construct, I think, is uh, a huge missed opportunity. Uh, your argument, or at least uh, the one that you're telling from uh, Josh Marshall, is that, well, on a national level, that may be the case. But on a local level, in terms of the races and winning back the House and the Senate, um, you, you, uh, it, it, they're still doing that, uh, sort of more under the radar. 
uh, in time. Yeah, I mean, Trump- it's starting to happen in a lot of ads. Uh, you're seeing it. You're seeing it in statements that are being made. They just, you know, one of those guys, you know, believe him or don't believe him. Uh, I never know whether, whether to with Cook or Rothenberg or any of right. them. <clears throat> but one of them just moved about five more House races. Uh, that all of them Republican races that you know into the, the, the either toss up. Or I, yeah, or I think we can't Democrat. even. I think we can't even predict because the real question, it seems to me, at least on that level, and I want to get back to the original point in a second. But on that level, the real question to me is going to be is going to be turnout. Like, there's two things that could happen here, right? Where people come out and they're like, uh, "I'm not going to vote for Trump. I'll vote for Johnson." Uh, or I'll, right. uh, I'll, I won't vote there, but I'm going to definitely have to vote Republican down ticket to stop, you know, to balance out Hillary Clinton. Or they see these polls and they're just like, I don't need to come out and vote against Trump as a Republican to make sure he doesn't win. I'm just not going to I'm not going to show up. And I think I think that that if there was a way to actually measure that, because people are still using likely voter models that are based on past performance. And we don't really know. We've never seen anything like this. So we don't really know. Because the the Republican group that is most likely to vote are college-educated voters. And that's the Republican college-educated whites of all the Republican constituencies. And that's the one that is most turning away from them now uh, and becoming, yeah. it's It's going to be fascinating. But the other point is... There's a, there's another paradox too. I mean, I think we're missing out on this opportunity for for Clinton to make a broad ideological argument, tie Trump in as the instead of like a an aberration for the uh, for the um, uh, aberration for the uh, Republican Party, he is indicative of the Republican Party. Instead of making that argument, she's um, she's she's saying he's you know uh, uh, sui generis as they say, uh, and. Um, but simultaneously, not just what's happening in the States, she gives a speech yesterday, which is, you know, if you had told me that she is going to hit these points at in August of the general election, I wouldn't, you know, I, 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 two years ago, let's say, OK, before I knew that Bernie Sanders was existed, you know, as a candidate, yep. before I knew that Donald Trump was going to be a candidate. If you were to tell me that Hillary Clinton would go out there, be forceful and specific. I mean, let's listen to just uh, forceful and specific on yep. debt free college for I mean, free college, free college for people uh, who are of, uh, you know, one hundred twenty five thousand households, one hundred twenty five thousand dollars and lower, um, you know, coming out for. Uh, raising the minimum wage, all the parental leave and, 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 and whatnot, but coming out forcefully against the TPP. And, and I didn't know anything else. I would have been like, Cliff, do, you, you know what? You got to get yourself, you got to check yourself into a hospital right now because you're insane. That's <laughs> crazy. And listen to what she said about the, uh, the TPP uh, yesterday. This is her uh, speech in Detroit. It was a long litany of, you know, Pretty people can say, like, I don't believe she's going to do any of this. All right, well, good enough. But I'm saying in terms of rhetorical, this is a long list of very progressive um, policies she's laying out there. So we have a non-ideological campaign where she is trying to she's not holding the Republicans responsible for uh, for for Donald Trump. But on a day to day level. There's no grand ideological scheme here, but the policy set are pretty mm-hmm. progressive. It's 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 fascinating. I don't. I, I just. It, it's it's fascinating to me. Here she is we'll on the play TPP. It. I'll have a comment after that. All right. I, Here's I the TPP uh, segment right now. The answer is to finally make trade work for us, not against us. So my message, my message to every worker in Michigan and across America is this: I will stop any trade deal that kills jobs or holds down wages, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I oppose it now, I'll oppose it after the election, and I'll oppose it as president. And so, I mean, the after the election refers to the lame duck. And then in response today, um, the Obama administration, basically as part of the fast track authority, 
um, mm-hmm. put Congress on notice that it's going to be sending lawmakers a bill to imp- uh, to implement the TPP. That is a the, it's a submission of the draft of statement of administrative administration action, which establishes the 30 day minimum. So that's part of the, the fast track. We give you notice. It's a 30 day minimum that we give you notice that we're going to try and put this through. They're going to aim, obviously, for the lame duck session. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see if Clinton responds to this. It's going to be interesting to see what happens now. Um, yeah. and, and I don't think she's going to get in a big fight with the president of her own party who's supporting her. That's the thing. I mean, we'll have to see what she does. But she can stand up and say in generic terms that she'll oppose it without, like, showing up to man the barricades. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and the question and, is— that may affect certain congressional—obviously, yes. that gives cover to certain members of Congress to, to oppose it. There are um, 28 House Democrats who supported Fast Track. And for the um, for the House to pass this, um, Ryan is going to need those 28. And when Clinton comes out and says she's against it, right, he sort of like unshackles them to vote against the president. Now that's I'm- the key thing there. So that's the key thing, first of all. But second of all, and, and you know, this is again an argument I've been making for a while, and I think this is based on history, at least my understanding of it, which is. Um, there have been a lot of Democratic presidents, and we don't always know what their true feelings are. You know what I mean? I mean, if, you know, sometimes they evolve in different directions. You could say they devolve. It really depends what you think. But it's always the culture out there surrounding them, where the, where the strength is on various issues and movements overall in the party that determines really what happened. They can read polls. You know what I mean? And And... That's why I've always kind of, my point about Hillary Clinton has always been, there are a lot of people who said she was the, the person, you know, people I know that worked in the Clinton administration, progressives who said she was to the left on most of the issues. There are other people who certainly in the years since have said she's moved a lot to the right. The thing is, is that, is that if she's up there saying these things now, she's realizing, A, she needs to do this to keep her coalition together. But right. B, most of these things are very popular even beyond the Democratic Party. She gets it in a way that Obama didn't and maybe shouldn't have as much because, look, there wasn't a movement against against other tra- you know, trade in the past the way there is against TPP. There wasn't a movement you know, demanding overtime and, and a, a minimum wage increase. There was, but not with the strength it has now. We're increasing Social Security or any number of issues. The, I mean, you know, we've seen what's happened. The DLC is dead. Right? They've all gone over, and I guess they've, got, they've changed their resumes to third way, but it's, they used to have multiple of these sort of centrist organizations, and most of them are gone. Yep. And most of their senators are gone, too. Yeah. Right? I mean, look who popped up his, his goofy head the other day, Joe Lieberman, to say, hey, I may endorse Trump. And then he endorsed Hillary, because I guess Trump, you know. Well, no, you know what? Michael had a very yeah. good uh, theory on that. Uh, that was Lieberman knew the only way he could get attention was to pretend oh, that he was going to uh, endorse. That's actually a fascinating, like a great PR lesson. Come out I, I, yeah. with the, uh, with the uh, you know, like send up the flare. Uh, like I may do something that's really crazy so that I get coverage. And then when you come back to me for the next comment, uh, I was just being sarcastic. Right. And, and the, or just do the, I mean, it's the, the Trump lesson you know, which which he's always in the problem with him is that he says something really crazy, gets the attention, and then he still keeps doing things that are really crazy. The PR lesson is exactly what you said it is with Lieberman, which is, and I and I figured it was something like that. I'm just making the point that he popped up his head. You know, he said some stuff, and then in the end, even with Hillary Clinton and all the progressive rhetoric and the fact that uh, that she is is supporting the Iran deal. Um, you know, in, in which he, of course, very much opposes because he's him. Among other things, he still endorsed her. So he, all the all these centrists are, you know, in the party or, or who are either in office, not in office, are still getting behind her. And you know, their 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 coalition, Blue Dogs, you know, and others are much. It's a much weaker coalition than it used to be. So if people keep up and keep their voices out there. And groups keep working. I have no doubt that you can you can make this, you know it can be a very progressive presidency. Obviously, we still need to get her elected. Um, but but that that's what I think a lot of this is saying. And and yeah, I wouldn't have said to you, Sam, that I thought she was going to do this because I would have thought I was crazy too a couple right. of years ago. 
Yep. But, you know, a lot of people worked very hard and moved things in a positive direction, changed culture, and I, I think that that can really influence this, you know, both Congress and the president. So and that was kind of a lot of my argument, you know, when there were some people that were pissed at, at Hillary and were saying, oh, you know, it's a lesser of two evils or I can't stand her, and there are people angry after the, the primary, you know, and I was like, well, you know, once you get past the emotional part of it, which I understand people need a little time, remember that you can influence and change stuff that Hillary Clinton does. She actually kind of has to listen to you to a certain degree because she wants to get reelected. Uh, Donald Trump doesn't. Right. In fact, by opposing you, he gets more popular. So by pointing you out and calling you out in front of people and turning his minions on you, he gets more popular. So, you know. There's that. That's exactly. Uh, it's a great point. And um, all right, we'll talk more about this uh, uh, in the uh, coming weeks. Um, and but but I, I can I say just the final thing I'll say on that on what you brought before. I really do think it is very, uh, and I understand what Corey was saying, but I really do think it's it's very very um, effective still to on on the national level just to make sure that she gets elected. Do this now. Um, while on the local level, tying Trump and to around all of their necks, especially all those who've endorsed him or refused to endorse her, doesn't really matter. You can really go after them. The key to me is more what she does after the election. Yeah, I agree. Because after the election, she needs to stand up and say, you know what, Republican Congress, you've got, you know, if it is. I, Indeed, so Republican House. You have an eight percent approval rating. You've done nothing. My policies are overwhelmingly popular, and to do what Obama didn't do, which is if she has to barnstorm the damn country, whatever she needs to do, to, in, in, especially when she's won, hopefully in places like Arizona and Georgia and North Carolina and all these, is to go to these people's home states, get in their faces, and say, yeah, yeah you know what. I've got these two or three economic priorities. You're going to pass them. Well, I mean, look, I mean, here is, uh, uh, you know, and this is uh, I'm going to continue. We'll continue this conversation. I am still a little skeptical that one can expect her to do that if she's not doing is setting the groundwork for that now. And so, uh, you know, on a national level, on a broad ideological level. Uh, but, um, but there's, there's definitely an argument there and, and we'll have it, uh, but we'll do yep. it. Another and we'll time. see. I think it's whether she can pivot from, here's all the policies I believe in. And these are the ones that work. You should be for them. Uh, if she can pivot from that to saying, well, you Republicans, even though you're not Donald Trump, maybe, well, guess what? You're acting like him. You're not for them. This is what's good for the country. And I will fight you on it. And that's what she has to be able to, to right. do. Right. I mean, we'll it, see. It, 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 and, and. You know, it's it's amazing because, you know, you don't roll out the new products right until September. So none of this was supposed to happen right now. And yeah. uh, we will see what happens when we get into those debates, if those debates happen. And uh, it's going to be fascinating. It's yeah, gonna be crazy. I, I, if he if he debates, I think I, I think still... I think at one point I think it I think he will. I mean, I think uh, because particularly if he thinks he's going to lose, because what? Why wouldn't he want the attention? Well, it's a big free audience, yeah, it's right. attention. We'll see. And, and is he, he believes even if he gets his ass kicked in them, first of all, he'll never believe he got his ass kicked in anything is good attention. I think so, there's know. a good chance I'm going to be credentialed for the one in Vegas, and I would say that there is a I, – I think there's only a 15% chance of that happening. I think he does one or two, and then he's like, it was unfair. I'm not going to do it again. Cause he has that's to. right. That may be what it is. If he thinks he can get more attention out of not doing the last one than doing it, yep. then – there's that. Cliffy, always a pleasure. Thanks, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. Too. Thanks, man. Bye. Bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Always a pleasure to talk uh, to Cliff Schechter uh, about this stuff. He's very smart about it. And um, there is, uh, you know, I think uh, on Monday, uh, Digby's going to be um, Digby's going to be on, and we're going to talk more about this sort of concept of, you know, uh, is there a big missed opportunity here? Now, you know, I, I guess it's not as, uh, you know, the, the one thing about Obama that uh, I, I genuinely appreciate is he has now made me jaded enough to not anticipate, you know, not to expect uh, someone, you know, uh, a, a Democratic nominee to actually uh, move this needle. But in some ways, like, you know, 
he was not in the general election either in 2008 or 2012 proposing the laundry list of progressive uh, issues that she is. So it's, it's very strange. I mean, it's great in that respect. Uh, whether or not I guess she'll carry through on them is, you know, one thing. But, you know, we're talking. We don't know that anybody's going to do anything, they say. All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, Matthew Film Guy will be in the house, as they say. Mm -hmm. Jesus is beside himself. Jacob's in a state of decimation The writing on the wall Isn't writing at all Just forces of nature In love with a weather station Hand in hand through the great doorway at dawn. The writing on the wall said Jesus saves. The writing on the wall mentions honey playing a game with the waves. You can follow. We are back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, on every casual Friday. I like to bring on someone who is either uh, in the entertainment business or has been in the entertainment business or is currently an entertainer or understands uh, the medium of television and film in a way that uh, others don't to come on and give us ostensibly or ostensibly to give us a, uh, a movie recommendation that I will ostensibly uh, watch over the weekend, uh, which I find I have less opportunity to do since the birth and growth of my son, Saul. There was, a, there was a short window where I could do that, but I do my best. And um, in, uh, and consistent with that um, uh, program, what we like to do, if they're a regular, is to have a song to play before they come on. Yes, 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 ladies and gentlemen, it's Matthew Film Guy, the juxtaposition between this sort of charging heavy metal music, which seems almost slightly out of control, uh, and the, um, the, the person it introduces, who is completely in control, very measured, and... Um, uh, very much um, thoughtful in regard to uh, his movie suggestions. Uh, it's Matthew Film Guy. Hey, what's up, cucks? <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, and I guess, cucker, maybe. I don't know. Cuckette. Cuck, 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 gold. Um, yeah. What's up, guys? We, uh, you know, I, last night uh, I realized uh, uh, Matt had told me uh, early in the day that tomorrow is our 1400 uh, show, and so I, I, I tweeted it out last night. And uh, I tweeted it out late because Saul didn't go to sleep until like 1130 for whatever reason. And um, I got like half of the responses I got uh, had the word cuck in it. <laughs> Keep cucking, oh, cucks. Man. Yeah, well, it was all. That was the best. I think it's pretty clear that uh, cuck is the word of 2016, and uh, the sooner you guys get it uh, out there, I think the better. So just keep up the good cuck. 
I, I think so. I mean, you know, uh, for a long time, um, uh, my uh, trolls would refer to me as a uh, uh, well, as a as a dirty Jew or as a whatnot. But uh, but still metrosexual. True. That's all still true. But I'm no longer a metrosexual. I am a cock. And uh, yeah, so it's so. not your personal. Why is that ridiculous? Kelly's saying it's when ridiculous. I can be metrosexual. Metro- when do they call I you that? I have told you this before that. M- you cannot be a metrosexual and own only two pairs of pants that are cargo pants. People don't see. No first wears. of all, they're not cargo pants. I don't own cargo pants. Okay. You own cargo shorts. They're car hearts. No, he, he they're owns, car heart pants. Matthew, he owns two long pairs and oh, two I, I'm familiar. I'm, pairs. I'm, I'm, you know, sad <laughs> to say, I am familiar with the limited nature of Sam's wardrobe from having yeah, worked with him. But the thing is, people who watch me on YouTube, they don't know that. They see my wide array of, of, of shirts and blouses and, <laughs> and say that I'm a metrosexual, and that's all over. I, that's so the, that basically also just means dirty Jew. That means dirty right, Jew. Fair but enough. Cuck. Yeah, I think, I think they confuse uh, your personal grooming habits with your ethnicity, and I think it's great that now you're no longer defined by your personal grooming habits, the fact that you maybe wear a certain kind of glasses that make you look you know, a certain kind of way. But instead, you're defined by the fact that your wife has sex with other women while you watch. Uh, other men, excuse me, while right. you watch. Right, exactly. I'm sorry. I, I was confusing what I think about. Uh, Can you mind. keep it down? I'm trying to read a social security <laughs> report. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wait, can oh, I just man. say that this that, reminds no, me no, of no, the dynamic that's happening with Medicare? Yeah. What? Sorry. Go ahead, Kelly. Cost I'm savings are up um, over inflation. I don't think this is not um, a directed toward an offhand comment made by you just now, Matthew Film Guy. But uh-huh. uh, I don't. <laughs> no, I mean, because it just was an offhand comment. But it, uh-huh. I don't think Cucker is. Uh, I don't like. I don't want to be in this whole Cuck. Oh, she's saying, situation. don't include me in this situation. I don't want to be uh, one, listen, a what about woman cuckazoid? sleeping with someone in front of my cuckazoid, husband. Yeah. Or Look, what let about cuckazoid? Me, let me, whatever. I don't want to be one of those Let me answer for things. Matthew Film Guy. He was being sarcastic. No. <laughs> yeah, I was just being sarcastic. I, don't I didn't think say he that Kelly be- founded cuckolding. I just was being sarcastic. I, don't, I just don't even want to pretend like... Cause it yeah, recently, don't worry. You know what? You're bringing so much more attention to it, it would have just floated right by if you hadn't said anything. So, you know, don't worry about it. Whoa. <laughs> no, Whoa. I'm serious. Don't, you, you're under no danger of being sucked into the sophomoric nature of the cuck world if uh, you just ignore it. Well, I'll bring me. Chinese food and my Medicare reports, and I hope everything <laughs> is set up on your end. Okay. Well, in recent days, you know, uh, you really are going to make this a thing. Pull the plug. Eject. Abort. So, Sam. No, you know what? Actually, I'm not going to do that. Because, no, because... Uh, Go ahead. Because it has come up. It, it, it Does it bother me? Uh, is, it, is it somehow, a f- like... You don't offensive? like being called a cuck. No, no, is the whole cu- non-stop cuck talk offensive? <laughs> We've, it's First of all, cu- it's not non-stop. It has to stop to start again. So it stops for a little bit, and then it starts up again. True. But it, it, it's kind You're of such on, a cuck. on multiple shows. It, it, is, it, is it offensive to me? Because I don't par- participate in it. And I've said no. It's not. It's okay. just a joke. Right. Okay, so, but Kelly, you realize, you do realize that it's, Everyone making fun of those who would use it unironically. Mm. All these people calling Sam Wait, a what? what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I did. Oh man, did I, yeah, did I just Matthew, pull the I lid off the whole thing? That. I mean, did it's I a joke. I mean, Sam takes it as a joke and it implicates his own personal life. No, I get yeah. the, I get the, I get the layered nature of. No, I. What I try and do is I try to appropriate it. Right. I'm not taking it as a joke. I'm just, um, I'm accepting right. it and moving on. Okay. Well, that's you funny appropriate too. their language. That's right. I think any man that would say appropriate is it's a, cuck. a total cut. Well, yeah, I was I'm just, fine with it. I was just bringing it up because I've been asked multiple times if it bothered me, and it doesn't. Well, I didn't ask. I didn't ask. Oh. <laughs> You're pissing her off. You know that, Matthew, right? Stop being a cuck. 
Is that is that hard to do? From from what I can tell. It's not Whoa. Hard to do. Kelly anyway, has thanks. left the building. Wait. <laughs> what is she? I'm what sorry. I just I thought I was I thought I was Matthew the film guy, not Matthew the cuck explainer. I, I can't hear you. Uh, you. You really <laughs> did piss off Kelly. Sorry, Kelly. He just apologized. Not the first time you've done it. So. All right. Well, Matthew, good job. Uh, so uh, what, uh, what, what film are you going to recommend? Shoa now after all that? <laughs> you would be the cuckold on oh, Robin man. Island, Matthew. Um, God, talk yeah. about what else? ruining the party, Matthew. <laughs> I'm sorry, but who asked her to butt in? I'm trying to do my segment here. Well, all right. Wow. I, I I don't know if this works for you at home, buddy, but uh, it doesn't work here. Wow. Okay, okay. Sorry, Kelly. You're not a cuck. She's gone. <laughs> what? She actually left? She's she's. I think she just she literally bought a, a plane ticket. <laughs> that she she doesn't know when she'll be back again. What's that song? Uh, I'm right. leaving on a jet airplane. A jet on a jet airplane. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, Matthew. What um, so Sam? Le- I, we we just got off on a, on a huge tangent. Uh, I don't even know what it was, but um, so it was just, about cuck. give us the update. <laughs> <laughs> give us the update on. I know we're, we've just lost. I think probably twenty like percent of our membership. Uh, <laughs> give us the update on uh, your eBay sales. Oh, well, it's funny you should mention that, Sam, because I just got a huge new load of inventory from my mother. Yes, you won't believe this, but she is actually letting go of her license plate collection. I, I, uh, I mean, I believe it. I uh, wasn't even aware she had one. So she has a license plate collection? How big is it? It's extremely large. Well, I mean, can you, I mean, it seems to me that that would be a number, right? It would be a number. How many license Actually, plates? you know what? Those are, those are yet to go up. I have, she has about 45 license plates stretching back to 1939. And, oh, wow. uh, uh, yeah, and they're, and they're going on eBay. I have uh, BMX magazines. I have, uh, what else do I have? Oh, I have keys. Do you need some keys? Some old keys? No. Um, Who buys this stuff? I mean, honestly. Well, I could see people buying all of that except for the BMX m- magazines. But, Matthew, let me are you ask you. The BMX magazines are the number one item on there. They're all classic. Old keys? Oh, classic BMX <laughs> ma- magazine. Okay. Yes, going, going I didn't realize the they 80s. were the classic version. Well, wait and a second. Anyone who's, How much anyone does who's a 1939 license plate night. go for? I would imagine that's going to, like, that. Yeah, the, uh, no, I have to. I'm getting an expert to price those before those goes up, go up. So, anyone who's uh, following my eBay auctions will have to hang out for another week or so. But those are all being priced as we speak. Now, what do you do? You go to, like, you try and get on uh, Antique Roadshow to get those analyzed? No, actually, or what do you do? my mother's boyfriend is like, this is who got her into the collection thing. So he's going to, like, price them all out for me and know how to, you know, because also some of them are made out of porcelain. Some of them are made out of metal. I have to get, it gets very technical, Sam. You don't understand. The, the license plate world you don't even so now do you have these now do you go visit your mom and she gives them to you and you bring them back to your house and then what what happens married says like what are you doing matthew exactly mary says why the hell did you bring more fucking shit into our house we just got this office cleaned up and now you're (laughs) you're ruining it with more does she get angry about it she get really angry uh, you know, she's not angry. You know, Mary doesn't really get angry about it, but I can tell it's like she's extremely annoyed, and uh, she wonders why I'm doing it. And all I say is, look, we have another mouth to feed now. You know, we have our beautiful boy Dudley, who we are teaching and learning and uh, trying to you acclimate your dog? To the ways of the world. Yes, Dudley, our uh, dog Dudley. You, okay. You've heard about him. Okay. And he is, you know, I don't want to make him feel any guilt about this, but he's kind of expensive. You know, he needs to eat every day, and he needs to be cleaned, and he needs toys, and... All the crap that we bring in here is all for Dudley. And usually when I put it in those terms, she understands. But okay. I still need to get out of here quickly. All right. I don't know, Sam. When, when you do something that makes your wife upset, what does she do? Uh, it's just, I can't tell. It's a constant stream of uh, she's upset. So I can't okay, really tell when it's a fine. Downshot. I'll get my social security reports ready. <laughs> she's like, why are you printing all, all those, uh, those documents? Uh, well, I, I prefer to go through uh, the trustee report with my, my uh, highlighter, and it's just easier for me to do that. 
Yeah, the two. The two I'm constantly the printer's the constantly are, moving at our our apartment. That's really the only thing. It's just the documents, and yeah. then of course I've, I can't I can't throw them out because they've all been uh, they've all been highlighted and marked up. So, <laughs> um, all right. So uh, so that's uh, what's happening for you on eBay. That's got to be big. Yeah. This is I feel I'm like glad this... that we've made that a regular feature of my appearances. Now it really helps that my mother every year every summer comes and uploads a new inventory. I think eventually her garage is going to be empty. And I'm going to be out of stuff to move. But thank you for bringing that up. I'm sure everyone loves that part of the. Of the oh segment. yeah, no, that's uh, really good. And so, what else? Uh, what else interesting is uh, going on in your life? Uh, I, I imagine nothing, because that's probably crowding it out. The license plates. I mean, it takes a lot. I mean, between Dudley, you know, we're taking Dudley to these puppy classes where he gets socialized and he learns to meet other dogs and not bite their faces off. Uh, you know, I'm trying to keep my garden in the backyard alive in all this freaking heat, which is not not that easy. And no. these uh, Very boxes. Difficult. Yeah. You know, I took Dudley to the uh, um, uh, vet the other day, and Mary went in with Dudley, and I was parking the car, and I was wearing my Bernie Sanders T-shirt, and I wanted to tell you this story real quick. Somebody in a white pickup truck pulls up and sees me, like, putting the little ticket in the dashboard, you know, you have to do in New York uh, when you park the car, and he says, uh, hey, man, you, you, you're not going to vote for Hillary now, right, because of all that uh, email, and, uh, she, you know, she, she rigged it, right? I'm like, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe I'll vote for Jill Stein. He's like, yeah, but okay, but you're going to stay home, right, because you're mad. Are you going to protest, right? I'm like, no, I'm I'm probably going to vote for Jill Stein. You're going to vote for Trump, man, and he pulls away. <laughs> <laughs> It was like it was like he threw an egg at my house and ran. <laughs> you know, it was so insane. That is, but wow. That's in my neighborhood, and like, you know, the Brooklyn of Queens, the story of New York, you know. So, it, so there is, there's, there's an element out there still. There still is. Well, um, the the dead enders. I'm not surprised. I, you know, I would think actually, from 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 Queens to Long Island, I bet is still going to be one of the most sort of uh, popular places in uh, you know this half of the country for right. for Donald Any, Trump. He was being sarcastic. Like what what about sarcasm? You don't understand. He's being sarcastic. Yeah, you're gonna vote for that bitch Hillary. Yeah, it's like all the, yeah, all exactly. the misogynists with with a uh, with a uh, New York accent are gonna vote for him. All right. Anyway, so, all right. So Matthew, uh, and, and, what have you got yeah. for us this week? Uh, what what, what? I, got a, I just got one other question for you. Have you ever been to Block Island? I have never been to Block Island. I've heard some very okay. nice things about it. All right, this week is my uh, coming up is my birthday, and we're going to Block Island. I thought you'd give me some pointers. Oh, you mean your, your, old, your by, old territory? By we, you mean me? Am I, am I going? No, no, no. Mary and I and Dudley. Uh, Our just family. be careful for ticks. Ticks, right? That's the he's only. He's got that brevecto. He he just took his first. He's got all his shots. Well, I'm now. worried about you too. I mean, make oh, sure me. you guys oh, check. Oh, like Lyme time. disease. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Nikki had yeah. Lyme disease for quite some time, so that was really. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a bummer. I know yeah. that can be early debilitating. Yep. Uh, I'll probably Not just good. stay inside then. I'll just stay inside. Yeah, don't go outside. Uh, that yeah. would be my I mean, advice. If you're going to Block my... Island, stay inside. Yeah. Don't yeah. go. Yeah. Don't go <laughs> out of the house. Yeah, I hear there's beaches. I would say. Yeah, I wouldn't go to the beach. Definitely would not yeah. do that. All, All right, right. Good idea. So good idea. Uh, that's my Block Island advice. In fact, I wouldn't go. Thank you. That would well, be I already advice. booked the hotels. It's okay. And, you know, so it's okay. It's kind of, so have them send you, you some postcards. Work? There you go. I'll just let Mary and Dudley go and have a good time without me. Um, so what do you have to recommend that we, uh, that we watch? Uh, I have a movie. Hmm. It's a really good movie, and as you know, uh, I've been showing these kinds of art films to my uh, senior citizens film class at the uh, Forest Hills JCC. Of course. And uh, this this one went over really, really well. Um, but of course, I have to preface that by saying I have a extremely sophisticated senior citizens class. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you, you have to judge that by it's on a curve, sort of. But um, I want to sh- uh, tell you about a Turkish film called Once Upon a Time in Anatolia. Now, I, I brought up Turkey with the class because it's been in the news, and usually that's like a hook that helps us generate some conversation. But um, this film, is, it's like one of those really great artistic statements that shows you what life is like in a place without it telling you anything. It just sort of, you're there, and all the drama is subtextual, and you kind of have to understand what it's like to live in, this is like the rural areas of Turkey, this Anatolia, and you kind of have to understand what it's like, the political scene, what the sort of social mores are, 
to understand the, 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 the drama. But essentially, this is like a police procedural told in a kind of abstract, ambient style. So it's like a two-and-a-half-hour movie about uh, a group of men accompanying two uh, prisoners. It's like the police chief and the coroner and the prosecutor to have him show them where he buried a murder victim. And it basically devolves into this kind of like fiasco where they can't find it and they have to spend a night in a, wait, wait, a, in hold, a hold village. Wait, wait, hold on. So yeah. I need to know the social mores of Turkey to enjoy this movie? I mean, I didn't necessarily know them, but you kind of have to use context clues, you know, to, to sort of figure out, like, why they, they call up the mayor of this small town, and he invites them in, and they're sitting in his little kind of, like, run-down shack of a house, and he's being very vigorously generous to them, giving them food and drink, and then his, his daughter comes in. There's, like, no women in this movie, basically, and huh. the daughter comes in, and it is this most, like, it is almost like a religious moment when these men, including the condemned men, see this woman. And without a word being said, it, like, completely changes the, the sort of di- direction of the plot. And, again, it's n- no man- not many words are spoken. And um, it, so it's kind of like if this was in America and they all just saw this woman, you'd be like, whatever. But the fact that the women are so kind of... Um, I don't know, their place is, let's say, specialized, to be nice, uh, that it, it kind of impacts what you understand about the place. And look, I've never been to Turkey. Uh, maybe, I don't know if you have, Sam. Uh, Michael, I know you studied there, right? Yes. So uh, this was like a, uh, like a trip to Turkey, and not just to like the cities, but to this sort of podunk area that uh, you, know, you really feel like you are there and you absorb what it's like to be there. And this is a filmmaker whose other films I've, th- that I've seen I've really enjoyed, and he won the Cannes Film Festival with this film, and I think his next film after this one, his last name is Chelan. I can never get his full name right. It's like Nuri Bilge Chelan, but he's a, 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 a real master of the international cinema these days, and just with beautiful imagery, extremely gorgeous cinematography, and a kind of bare, thin thread of a narrative, yet it's this kind of genre police procedural he, he carries you through this two-and-a-half-hour, like, really, you know, semi-spiritual ex- uh, experience that uh, I was extremely moved by, and all the senior citizens to a person were extremely uh, entertained and enraptured by. Hmm. So I say definitely put this on your list for once. Saul is, I don't know, bar mitzvah maybe. Right. And you, ha- and you have about two hours. Well, uh, maybe I'll have a chance to go, a- and uh, maybe I'll take an annex class uh, on uh, Turkish culture so that I can understand this movie. Yeah, you know what? This movie itself, it makes me feel like that I got a kind of a crash cultural course in what it's like to be there. Because it's also about the social strata. There's one of their drivers is an Arab man, and he's kind of teased by the uh, police chief, who's sort of a working class guy who's extremely hot-headed. And he's sort of uh, in thrall to the prosecutor, who's an educated, uh, older, wealthier man. And it it really is it's similar in some ways to... Uh, Renoir's Rules of the Game, where you kind of see the upstairs and the downstairs, but it's all within this group and the kind of mini dramas. There's so many mini dramas that it's one of those films where you, there's no main character, and that's one of my favorite things about these kinds of films is you're never your your consciousness is never funneled through one perspective. You're given a lot of multiple threads to kind of uh, bring to bear on what's happening, and and it's just. It's just- I, Okay. I can't say anything more good about it. Yeah. All right. Is it on Netflix or is it on, uh, where do you stream this up? This is, okay. uh, you know what? I will have to confirm where it is for you. Uh, one, one second here. I, but I do think it is widely available. Okay. Um, Total that, cock. You, you might move. be right. I just tried to look for it, and I think it might just only be on iTunes. All right. Okay. That's I okay. It is then. I'm, uh, yeah. I, I will, uh, I'll spring for something like that. I mean, sounds like a good family movie night on uh, Saturday night. For the kids, I mean, yeah. If one of them or two of them are sleeping, <laughs> that never ever happens. Yeah. But Matthew, film guy, thank you so yeah. much. Uh, My pleasure, Sam. You beautiful cuck. We will uh, po- <laughs> we will post that uh, that film on our uh, blog, of course, at majority.fm, as we always do, right, Michael? We post it in the posts of the show. Right, in the posts of the show. Yes. Uh, Matthew, and uh, obviously we don't always have do that. fun at Block Island. It's hit or miss. Happy birthday! 
Thank you very much, Sam. Cut to you later. Okay. <laughs> All right, we have a Jimmy Reef Cake song? All right, let's uh, have the Jimmy Reef Cake song, then we'll go into the fun half. This is Human Rights Crisis. Human Rights Crisis. Weed. The leaders of Saudi Arabia are in many ways just as bad as ISIS. Public flogging, chopping heads off, executing children. It's a human rights crisis. The goddamn United Nations must be a fraudulent organization. The Human Rights Commission sure seems like an odd position. Did they appoint Saudi Arabia the head to protect the human right to make other people dead? Sure seems like it to me. Another display of human hypocrisy. The hypocrisy could not be any clearer than in the story of Ali Muhammad Nimr. The young boy was sentenced to die for protesting the government. That's why. So come out to Dag Hammerskold Plaza in New York City. Friday, August 19th at 1 p.m. We'd like our country to pressure the Saudis to exhibit some human rights. After all, they're the goddamn leader of the United Nations Human Rights Commission. So it would make sense for them to stop with the public flogging, the chopping heads off, and at least, at least, at least, Stop with the executing of children. Well, uh, that is... First song without a weed reference. I have heard from Jimmy Reefer Cake. Ever? Ah, yeah, I was... I had no idea. That was a, uh, that's a good cause. Definitely, um, we'll put. Uh, let's put that protest on the uh, on the post. Someone uh, can. I believe that's um, Esha. Can she tweet that at me? I uh, will put it on the post. All right, all right, folks. Um, I'm going to head into the fun half. I will be back uh, Monday um, uh, on this program. We'll be talking to a Digby. Uh, and uh, remember, it is your membership that makes the show possible. Become a member today at jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. And if you buy your crap from Amazon, buy it through our link at majorityreportkickback.com. If you buy it from jet.com, granted, soon to be walmart.com, or I don't know what, but... MajorityReportKickback.com. At least we get a cut. All right, folks. See you in the fun half. 646-257-3920.